I miss your faces. I miss your hugs. And uh, it's, it's good to be together. Thank you for allowing my family to be gone for a couple of weeks. We had a, a funeral for Leah's cousin in North Carolina, and then we spent some time in Alabama with Dad and Gilda, and that was a good time, but uh, I'm glad to be back. I love that we get to celebrate our, our nation and what God's done here. Uh, there's lots of discussion as to what our forefathers did wrong of late, but there's lots that our forefathers did right. And we do live in a nation where we have the freedom to meet and congregate and worship together. We live in a nation where we have the ability to own land and possession, where we have the ability to speak, maybe not as freely as we used to, (laughs) but we do have a freedom of speech and a freedom and a right to bear arms and, and other rights and privileges that other countries don't provide. And so I'm glad that we're allowed to celebrate uh, the blessings that God's given our nation. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14. It's been about a year since we started into Acts, which is amazing. Um, it used to be that I would plan out a whole sermon series, pretty much the whole year, uh, in October or November and, and just kind of plan it out. And um, as I grew in my own personal faith and willingness to trust God, he kind of forced me to throw that out the window and said, you just preach what I tell you to preach. And for a while there, he, uh, he would have me go Sunday by Sunday. I didn't know what he'd have for me to do. But he's told me to stay in Acts. Stay in Acts. So it's not like I flipped a coin and said, oh, let's do the book of Acts. I like those letters. Let's, let's do that. No, it, it was God-oriented, and as we've seen or I've seen with discussion with other pastors and leaders, there's just been a, a movement of the church universal to look at Acts and study Acts, and, and even a, a book I just read recently by Francis Chan, uh, Letters to the Church, or Letter to the Churches, that uh, really touched down and started with Acts as well. But I think God has us here because he's caused us to unearth the essential core of what the body of believers is. The essential core of what the church is. Okay, And that's what we need to get at, because our normal way of worship has changed. It has. It's funny, you guys are all sitting on the left side, and I'm left-handed. I tend to go this way anyway. Um, That's... That's who we are. And, and so one, we're, we're scrambling to figure out, well, what does the church look like during COVID? What does the church look like when we can't hold hands together and gather together and seek face to face? And that's exactly what the early church faced, didn't it? They couldn't always meet together. They couldn't all be in the same place. They couldn't all go to a, a place designated as a place of worship, could they? And so what we need to start off with remembering is the four things. The four things that the early church did daily. Number one is pray. Pray. God told me at the start of this year that he wanted covenant to be a house of prayer for the nations like never before. And that is something that you can do daily. You have more time to do it. You have more availability to do it. Talk to God. Listen to what he tells you. Have this ongoing discussion. We're going to talk about this more in a little bit. Pray. Devote yourself to God's Word. Devoting means you are dedicated to it. You're you're setting it aside. It's special. Get in the Word daily. Um, One of the, the, in this season, myself and the rest of the church leadership has been praying for you and praying for guidance and direction. And, and, And I'm going to reveal something a little early, but You know, one of the things in in our church's history since I've been here that we've done over the years is radical discipleship, where you used to get what scripture I was going to preach on Sunday uh, for the next Sunday early. You get a list of questions and other things, and you discuss the sermon. Well, we, we did away with that because that season for radical discipleship was over because you guys learned the lesson. You got it. Well, what God's doing in this season is... Radical discipleship went into a cocoon, and now it's breaking out as a butterfly. And so what we're going to start doing every week, I'm jumping ahead here, but I can't hold this in, is is I'm going to give you guys scriptures. So we're all going to be reading the same scriptures every week. 
I'm going to give you dis- questions to kind of ponder the scriptures and discussions. We're going to preach on those things. So what will happen is, whether you can be with us in our midst or not, we're all studying the same thing. And so when we're all reading and studying the same passages, when you talk to one another, what are you going to talk about? What you've been reading, you're going to learn from each other and grow from each other. And then if you hear a message and teaching on the same stuff you've been studying, it'll really sink in. And you know what the next step to that could be? Maybe you could have a home group in your house with your media family or your neighbors or your relatives, and you can lead the discussion and teaching because you've been so immersed in that word by yourself and then in community and then with my preaching or Pastor Sean's preaching that you've got it and then you're ready to do the gospel, share the gospel. And so my job as pastor is to equip the saints to do the work. And the cool thing about this re-exploring of what we learn with radical discipleship is that this could go global in the sense that my, my parents in Alabama who are probably watching us right now. They could read the same scriptures, go over the same questions, have the same discussions, watch the same message, and have a home group with their neighborhood on the same topic. So what we're doing here, God can use anywhere. And that's how we are the church and can be the church in this time and in this season. So the second thing is devoting yourself to word. The third thing is fellowship one with another. That's a little more difficult, right? That's a little bit harder. But thank God for the internet. Thank God for Alexander Graham Bell and the telephone. Thank God for the ability to communicate without having to be face-to-face. And thank, for fa- thank you, Lord, for phase cards. There is still snail mail, as we call it. And if you ever get a card from Phasey in the mail, you know that love has been poured into that as she draws what God gives her to draw and gives you a message of hope. But I want to tell you, we still can communicate. That's essential. And and if there's something that can hurt the body of Christ during this time as, as we're forced to kind of be away from each other, is if we become islands unto ourselves. That leaves us very susceptible to the enemy. So communicate. And then break bread together. Now, this is probably the most difficult one of all, especially if you live by yourself. But breaking bread is not just sharing a meal at a table with somebody. You could even do that over a FaceTime call or Zoom call with somebody else. And I've done that with people before. But what it really gets to, and the reason why you pray before your meals, is because you're giving thanks to God. Jesus said when he broke the bread and and, and had the wine at the Last Supper, he said, do this in remembrance of me. They're the simplest elements you have. Bread and wine or bread and juice. And, and so any meal that you have, you can have communion with God, fellowship with God, reminding yourself that the true sustenance for your life comes from Him. And so if you do these four things every day, you're being the church and you're being fulfilled in the church. Praise God for that. The ongoing challenge of any pastor or preacher, and I've been doing it now for 18 years, it doesn't seem like I've been doing it that long, is to present God's Word in in such a way that it speaks to where a person is. It's relating to what's happening in the world and our culture, and it breaks the barriers that you face daily. But the temptation for any pastor or leader or teacher is to take the passage of Scripture that they're teaching And then find what they like about it and preach about it. You know, find the things that kind of makes them comfortable and avoid the stuff that makes them uncomfortable. That's why I like studying a book as a whole, because you can't skip passages, right? You can't, oh, I don't like chapter 13. I'm I'm just going to move on. You can't do that. And so, so the challenge is for all of us, and we tend to do that, right? We can see a story or an event, and, and we try to like to emphasize what we like. But God's word isn't supposed to be presented that way. Um, God's word is meant to challenge you, to take you from where you are and show you where God wants you to be. It's not a weapon that you wield and make it your own. It cuts you. The word divides through bone and marrow to the heart and flesh of all of us. And let me tell you something else, God, guys. God's word doesn't need your help. You don't have to soften it. You don't have to make it prettier. You don't have to apologize for it. 
The gospel of Jesus Christ saves people, not you or I. And so we need to allow it to do its work on us first. Um, I always laugh when, when, when folks come up to me after a sermon and said, Pastor, you really stepped on my toes with that message. And I like to say, well, you got it easy. Because God stepped on my toes all week in preparing this. You know, you don't, you don't have to deal with it the whole time. But, but, but God's word is meant to do that. Uh, in Acts chapter 14, Pastor Steve last week talked about the power of the Holy Spirit in, in the city of Iconium and how the power of the Holy Spirit, the power to bring healing and deliverance and miracles and the gospel itself does not come from some superhuman ability, but a walking with the Holy Spirit daily, a, an obedience to him, a listening to his voice, a sensitivity to him. And so that's part of our prayer life as well is we continually invite him into our life. We continually ask him what we're supposed to do. We're sensitive to his voice every day, and he enables us to do what he's caused us to do. And although they were doing miraculous wonders in this second city in Asia Minor, uh, there, there's a, a group that roused up a mob ready to stone them, and so they leave that area for the next. And so this is the second city in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, that has heard the gospel of Jesus Christ powerfully, the first one being Antioch and Pisidia, but it's the second one in a row that the enemies of the gospel, who shouldn't be enemies of the gospel, it's the Jewish people in these cities that are turning against the truth of Jesus Christ. You would think that the people that were looking forward to a Messiah and had a basic understanding would be the ones to embrace this message. But because they can't mold and fashion it their way, they're fighting against it. And so this group rallies up mobs in both these towns. And so uh, you have Paul and Barnabas fleeing for their lives in both these cities. But in each place they live, leave behind new believers who are transformed with the truth of Jesus Christ. Can you imagine trying to pursue Jesus without contact with your with your Preachers and teachers and leaders as consistently. Oh, you don't have to imagine it, do you? Because that's exactly what the early church went through. Can you imagine being in Antioch or, or, or Iconium or, or what we're going to see in Lystra? Being a new believer, hearing about Jesus Christ, getting saved and transformed, and the one who's supposed to teach you and lead you and guide you has to leave. How did those churches grow? How did they survive? The four things. A pursuit of Jesus Christ. And if the early church could do that, why can't we? Why does the church need to be floundering right now because we can't meet together because of a virus? Right? That shouldn't be the case. And so we are taking a, a lesson from, from the book of Acts. All right, so that's where we pick up. Paul and Barnabas head to Lystra and Derby. Acts chapter 14 8 through 20. While they were at Lystra, Paul and Barnabas came upon a man with crippled feet. He'd been that way from birth, so he had never walked. He was sitting and listening as Paul preached. Looking straight at him, Paul realized he had faith to be healed. So Paul called out to him in a loud voice, Stand up! And the man jumped to his feet and started walking. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in their local dialect, these men are gods in human form. They decided that Barnabas was the Greek god Zeus and that Paul was Hermes since he was the chief speaker. Now the temple of Zeus was located just outside the town, so the priest of the temple and the crowd brought bulls and wreaths of flowers to the town gates, and they prepared to offer sacrifices to the apostles. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard what was happening, they tore their clothing in dismay and ran out among the people shouting, Friends! Why are you doing this? We are merely human beings just like you. We've come to bring you the good news that you should turn from these worthless things and turn to the living God, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and everything in them. In the past, he permitted all the nations to go their own ways, but he never left them without evidence of himself and his goodness. For instance, he sends you rain and good crops and gives you food and joyful hearts. But even with these words, Paul and Barnabas could scarcely restrain the people from sacrificing to them. Then some Jews arrived from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowds to their side. 
They stoned Paul and dragged him out of town, thinking he was dead. But as the believers gathered around him, he got up and went back into town. The next day he left with Barnabas for Derby. Now, the beginning of this passage may sound familiar to you. If you look back at Acts chapter 3, you have a situation where Peter and John are going into the temple, their place of worship, and they notice outside the temple, at the gate called Beautiful, a man who was born lame. And it says that they noticed him and that Peter locked eyes with him and healed him. Very much the same scenario happens here. Paul is teaching. He notices a man lame from birth, locks eyes with him, and heals him. Now, the thing about that is, is you're dealing with two different sets of people. The first one was Peter and John. Now we got Paul and Barnabas. You're dealing with a totally different location. You're in Lystra. You're not in Jerusalem. You're not at the temple. A different culture, a different continent, a different country. I mean, you're, you're dealing with a whole different setup. And yet the only thing that's the same in both places is the Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, that's alive in you, did the work in both places. Now what does that say to us today? Do we have to be Peter or John or Paul or Barnabas? Do we have to be in a specific location for God to do the miraculous in and through us? No. It has to be the work of the Holy Spirit. A dependence upon Him. He's the one that does it. The faith to be healed was simply Paul noticing the fact that this man who's hearing about Jesus for the first time knows that Jesus loves him and believes and he says, you're healed. That's all that faith is. That's all it takes is to believe and receive and say, okay, you can do it. And he does it. He heals him. Now this causes quite a stir in Lystra as it did in Jerusalem. But in Jerusalem when this happened, everybody just assumed that the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob had healed this man that was lame from birth. Not such the case in Lystra, right? They do give credit to gods for healing, but not our God. It was the God Zeus and the other Greek God Hermes. Now, have, if you've ever wondered why God does not always work in miracles, this is one of the reasons. Because a miracle can be interpreted within the perspective of the people who are receiving it. Okay? It's, miracles can't always be interpreted the same way by the same people. You live in a certain uh, cultural context, okay? So if God were to uh, heal somebody who was lame from birth in our culture and society, they may say, oh, well, it was the medicine he was receiving all those years. Or, or it must have been the hand of a doctor. Or maybe his, uh, there was a, uh, something in, in his genetics that caused it to finally trigger. We, we all know. Somebody in Africa may say, yes, yes, it was... It was God, or it was our gods. It all depends on your region and area. So, so we want God to do the miraculous, yes, but to assume that every time God does the miraculous, people are going to get it, that's a wrong assumption. Let me remind you, church, that we currently live in a post-Christian culture. Now, the first time I heard anybody say that we lived in a post-Christian culture, I kind of got offended. Like, no, we don't. But the truth of the matter is, there's a majority of Americans now who, who don't know anything about Jesus. Not really, not besides the fact that they might say his name when they stub, his toe, stub their toes. Um, maybe never been in a church before. Not knowing what a church is like. Most people's perceptions of Christians is what Hollywood tells them, which isn't always very nice. And so... Uh, when God does anything miraculous, people will always seek to explain it within their worldview, within the way they're wired. And so they believed that this was an act of the gods, Zeus and Hermes. Now, why did they think Barnabas and Saul were Zeus and Hermes? Well, we're, we're living in this passage during the time of the Roman Empire, which they inherited from the Greek Empire. And so when the Greeks conquered the world, they brought in their philosophy as well as their gods throughout all different regions. 
And so we find out that outside this city was a temple dedicated to Zeus. So if something miraculous happens in their town, it must be from all those years that we've prayed to Zeus. He's finally showed up on the scene. He's here. And these, this, this guy that's kind of in the background, that must be Zeus. And the guy that's been uh, doing all the talking, I think his name's Paul. He must be Hermes. He must be the messenger of Zeus. And so they start to set up a party and a sacrifice and, and all the rest. Here's where the danger lies. Paul and Barnabas have been kicked out of the previous two cities by mobs. And now in Lystra, they're literally being treated as gods. Would this be hard to say no to? Just imagine what Satan must be whispering in the ears right at this moment. Finally, somebody giving you the credit you deserve. You do deserve this. You're appreciated. Enjoy the attention for a while. Yeah, they got you all mixed up. Yeah, they're saying you that you're Zeus and Hermes. They're all mixed up. But you're culturally relevant. People like you. And so, just enjoy the attention for a while and, and, and just take the time. You can clear it up later. Just, just relax. Just, just kind of enjoy this time, this moment. Don't exchange the life-transforming message of Jesus Christ for any temporary earthly pleasure. It's going to be a temptation for all of us, guys, to settle, to sell out. Let me let you in on a secret that shouldn't be a secret. Satan can't stop the gospel. If he could have, Jesus would have never broken the grave. Satan would have kept him there. And with a person in the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives, nothing can stop what the Holy Spirit is leading you and I to. Nothing! The devil is powerless. As we just sang, in a mighty fortress is our God, one simple word will fell him. And what is that word? Jesus. Jesus. So how... Does the devil hinder the work of God? He gets us to settle for less. Think back to Israel's national history. I repeat this all the time because the Bible repeats this all the time. God showed up on the scene in Abraham's life and made him a promise he didn't have to. You're going to have kids. And you're going to have descendants as numerous as the stars. And the land that you walk now is going to be their inheritance. And after 400 years of living in Egypt and and being brought out of slavery in the most dramatic, most miraculous way, they they spend 40 years in the desert because that first generation didn't have faith enough to take over the land. And when you get to the book of Joshua, they're standing at the verge of the promised land and God goes down the list and says, this is all that's going to be yours. Here's the list of all your territories. This is everything that I want you to take. My wife gives me a grocery list. She used to write it out, now she text messages it to me. And and I better get everything on the list, right? And if I add to the list, like extra Cheez-Its, I'm a big Cheez-Its fan, I don't know if they're good. Uh, You know, you, you get in trouble. So God is clear. He says, this is yours. And so they start taking over the land. Region by region, conquering, dividing. And then they start getting fearful of this group. And then they start compromising here. And what happened was... Those people, those territories, those tribes that got their land first, they stopped fighting. They stopped conquering for their brothers and sisters to have their homes. Because after 40 years of wandering that desert, I have my house and my land. And I kind of deserve to just lay back. I mean, I've got mine. I know you don't have yours yet, but I'm tired. I need this. I deserve this don't we do that as well? Me and Noemi were just talking about how short life is. Talking about her grandkids and my kids. Time flies. And yet the enemy wants us to just say, oh, I've done enough. I just, I deserve, I need. I... And then we fall back into the pit that Jesus rescued us out of. The greatest dangers to the church are not bullets, threats, and tyranny, 
the greatest threats to us as believers is praise and comfort. We all want to be celebrated. We all want to be loved. And the church has strived for years to be culturally relevant. Well, we will never be culturally relevant. Because Jesus is the greatest countercultural movement ever. It does not make sense to a fallen world to dedicate your life, to live for the eternal, to love when others are hating. It, it doesn't make any sense. And so here we're tempted with that. And yet here they're celebrated, right? Paul and Barnabas are celebrated finally and they can feel that way and yet they're not because verse 12 says that the people decided that Barnabas was Zeus and Paul was Hermes. They decided that. They weren't listening. They weren't paying attention. They didn't hear anything about Jesus. They decided in their hearts, that's who you are. You see, people want to make up who you are not really want to know you. That's not how Jesus works. Thankfully, Paul and Barnabas didn't succumb to this temptation. It says they tore their clothes and they pleaded with the people. Why did they tear their clothes. Well, maybe it was to say, hey, I'm flesh and blood. Look, I got chest hair. I got moles. I got white hairs growing here. Look, look, I, I'm normal like you. Oftentimes when a person would tear their clothes, it would to, to show their clothing was often their sign of authority. And they were saying, no, I, I have no authority. I, I, I'm nobody. I, I'm, I'm a mere human being just like you. And then they speak the truth clearly. There's three points to their message. The first is turn from worthless things. Turn from worthless things. The enemy, the devil, couldn't fool them. Everything is ultimately worthless in comparison to the reality of a relationship with God who created everything. Everything's worthless. What's more valuable than than being with the Creator than the creation? I'm a basketball fan. My, my favorite team growing up and still is in, in professional sports, although I don't watch much professional basketball anymore, is the Boston Celtics. And one of their greatest players of all time, I think he's the greatest player of all time, is Bill Russell. And uh, Bill Russell doesn't give autographs. Do you know why he doesn't get, give autographs? When he was early in his career, he was signing autographs for people. And the people that were asking for autographs were so rude to him that he realized they don't want me. They just want something from me. And so he stopped giving autographs, but instead invited people into having a conversation with him. Because he realized, I want to be in relationship with people that want to get to know me, not just get something from me. Now let's think about this, guys. Can we pray daily? Can we talk to the God of the universe as our Father any moment of any day? Or do we just want an autograph? Do we just talk to Him about what He can give us? Or are we get upset with Him when He took, takes something away from us? We got it all wrong, guys. The God of the universe invites us into relationship with Him, and we have it all. And if we ever forsake that for something that He created, we're missing the point. This passage, and um, I'm jumping ahead of myself. I've been uh, thinking a lot about worth and value. People all around this country right now are demanding justice for themselves because they believe they're devalued and they deserve more out of life. Pastor Sean, I think, mentioned it a couple weeks ago. There's a video by Phil Vischer who created VeggieTales. And he talks about um, a, 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 just about a seven-minute video of history past the Civil War and kind of relates how there were certain things our government set up, different laws and housing regulations and, and government decisions that really hindered the African-American community from Um, growing and developing and becoming prosperous in the United States post-Civil War. Things I never had heard of before. And it it made sense to me that that as much as people tried, they they weren't able to do so. 
And so it grieved my heart to hear about some of the dark underbelly of, of this great nation. And we've done a lot of great things, and God has, has used our nation to do great things. But there's always those things that you're kind of ashamed of um, that are happening. And so I, I, I read this and I see this, and I step back because this isn't my world. You know, I, I'm white. I'm not as white as Pastor Sean. I mean, his, like he said, his last name's Whiteman. You can't get more whiter than that. But <laughs> I love that line, by the way. That was awesome. Um, but, but that's not my world. I, I come from a low to middle class family. I, 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 that's not where I was. And yet, I didn't choose my family, and they didn't choose their family. God placed us where we are. We're born into whatever home and, and situation and, and, and period that we're in. And so, there are some things that I did realize. I did realize that no amount of money, respect, opportunity, or influence can satisfy. No amount of money. I, I don't care what your nationality is or what nation you live in, rich people aren't happy. There's never an amount in your bank account to where you're content, is there? You reach one plateau and you're saying, oh, I wish I had more, and then I wish... Money doesn't satisfy. Some of you are saying it would make things easier. Listen, <laughs> It comes with a different set of problems. Money can be a problem as well. Then you, you look at, at respect. You know, you're never going to have everybody respect you. There's opportunities come and go. Influence can come and go. And then I was thinking about reparations. You know, that's a big discussion. I, there should be reparations made. We, we should be paid back for what earlier generations have done to us. I don't have the ability to pay back reparations, and no amount of reparations can cover up the amount of hate and anguish that people have gone through. But what the African-American community desires is hope, a chance at a better life, and fulfillment. And you know what? I don't think there's anybody in this room that doesn't want the same thing. We want hope, we want a chance at a better life, and we want fulfillment. And just like everyone else, it can't be found in worthless things. Sometimes you've got to experience what you think will satisfy before you realize it won't fulfill. Ravi Zacharias went home to be with the Lord a few weeks back now. A champion of the faith, I encourage you guys uh, to listen to any of his teachings you can find. His ministry was called RZIM, Ravi Zacharias International Ministries. But one of my favorite messages he ever gave he talked about the lowest point in your life is when you feel is is what you feel after you experience what you think will ultimately satisfy you. And he says that's the let, let down that sports figures have when they achieve a championship. They hold the trophy, they cry over it, they're so excited, and then the morning next morning they wake up and they're not fulfilled. My wife in her testimony, if you've heard it before, talks about holding our first daughter Emma. After five years of infertility, she held my daughter Emma and loved her and was thankful, but she was surprised that the feeling she had was not the fulfillment she desired. And I can tell you, if you've lived long enough in this world and you've marked off some of the things on your checklist as to what you think you would have that will fulfill you, it's never enough. One of my daughters, just this past week, uh, they went to Dollar General and she bought a little $5 item thing and uh, came back with it, and it had a whole bunch of junk in it. She was so happy about it. Well, the next day, I had to go back to Dollar General and get something else. And so another kid got something. Well, the first daughter, when I came back and got, came back with the other kid and saw that they had stuff, she said, well, where's my stuff? I, I bought something for all my sisters the other day, and, and why didn't they buy anything for me? I said, wait a second. You just got something yesterday. And it didn't fulfill you. Do you think I want to give you more stuff today that won't fulfill you? That's not how that works. And that's how God is with us too. We need to realize at some point in our life that everything that we're striving for won't fulfill us. Another documentary that I watched was Michael Jordan and the, the, the Last Dance. He used to have that, that commercial Gatorade and want to be like Mike. I don't want to be like Mike after watching that documentary. That man had no freedom and no life. 
Everybody wanted something from him. He always had to be in the spotlight. It's a tough thing. So the second thing, if, if those are all worthless things, what will satisfy? And that's Jesus Christ. Notice that he says, turn from worthless things and turn to the living God. We can't have both, guys. We can't hold on to our worthless things and have the living God. That's why Jesus told the rich young ruler, sell all you have, get rid of the worthless things, give to the poor, and come and follow me. There are things in the church, in your life, that is worthless that's holding you back. And God says, get rid of it. Maybe, if it's, not, maybe it's something you don't even have. Maybe it is a desire to have more money. And God says, no, I'm going to keep you poor. He says, blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for they'll receive the kingdom of heaven. Maybe it's something. And he's saying, just have me. Have me. Jesus is the only answer for every individual around the world. No matter what race, what family, what nationality you're born into, his love is equal. And his sacrifice was paid for every single one of us. Do you believe that this morning? Did Jesus pay all your debts? Did he buy you with a price? I can't make reparations for, for all the racism in our culture and the racism in my family, but I don't have to. You know why? Because Jesus paid it all. He paid every debt. And he looks around a room like this, and he says, I forgive you, and I forgive you, and I forgive you, and I forgive you. All your debts are paid. All of you are wiped clean. All of you in my presence are now no longer indebted to anyone. And I want you, and I want you, and I want you, and I want you to be my daughters and my sons and take my name and live in my house and all be equally mine. That's what Jesus does. And so we live in this world where we're warring with each other. We're saying, no, you need to give me this and I got to take this and all the rest. And at the foot of the cross... He says, I took it all. I paid it all. My blood shed for everyone. That's why we can't waste our time arguing with people about who did what and who's responsible. Give them Jesus. Love them. Forgive them. That's why Paul and Barnabas couldn't compromise the message for their own comforts. Because it would mean they would give up what was greater worth and they'd end up just in the pit with the people they were sent to deliver. The third thing is recognizing that the good things in life come from Him. We can't settle for anything less than Jesus for ourselves. And if we settle for less than Jesus, then we're choosing that for other people. I love the fact that God has disrupted our rat race life with this COVID-19. I mean, I'm not thankful for COVID-19. Don't, you don't quote me on that. But I'm thankful that he's using it to disrupt. Anybody ever have a hamster or gerbil with the wheel? Right? Man, they are working as hard as they can, spinning that thing. Heart rate up, everything else. Do they get anywhere? That's what life is like if you're pursuing anything but Jesus. You'll, you'll go through life and you'll think you're getting somewhere, and you'll realize I haven't gotten any further and further. And the older you get, I know I'm only 41, but the older you get, the more you look back on your life and think, huh, I wasted all that time and money and effort to get here, and I don't feel any better than I did there. Unless I'm following Jesus. Unless I'm following Jesus. And then the things that were important to you before just kind of fall away. When we already have all that we need in Jesus. It's like getting your birthday presents when it's not your birthday. It's like getting to eat dessert before your meal. That's who Jesus is. He, he, it's like getting the prize before you start running the race. Yes, the goal of eternity is, is heaven with Jesus but he says, I don't want to wait till you get to heaven for me to be with you. I want you now. So guys, we have everything right now when we have Jesus. 
We have everything. So we got to stop saying, I'll be happy when. I'll be satisfied when. I'll be content when. The passage ends with the Jews showing up from the previous two towns, souring the people against Paul and Barnabas to the point where they're literally stone Paul, thinking that he's dead, and drag him outside the city. Is there a greater illustration for what the praise of men and women is valued at? Who praises you today may curse you tomorrow. People's praise does not last. And yet we're a socially uh, uh, media-driven society where everything seems to be based on likes and dislikes, right? People like me, I must be good. If people dislike me, I'm going down. Who likes you today will hate you tomorrow. Let me also say persecution is reality for believers in Jesus Christ. When I first came to Covenant as your pastor, one of my early sermons, I challenged you to pray, pray for persecution. And I had some people that, that really didn't sit well with. Why would I pray for persecution? I don't want persecution. I don't want hatred in my life. I don't want people to tear. Why would I pray for that? Well, this book that I just finished reading from Francis Chan, Letter to the Churches, some of the churches that he was in ministry with in India, they had three tenets, and the last tenet of the church was that they'd be under persecution. Because they understood the concept that if you're following Jesus and you're professing the truth and living by the truth, that you're going to have people that hate you. You're going to have problems. You're going to have fights. You're going to have quarrels. So I think we just need to get to the reality of what Jesus said. In this world, you'll have trouble, but take heart of overcome the world. If they hated me, they're going to hate you. We need to stop avoiding persecution, being fearful of persecution, acting like it's not going to happen, and just embrace the fact that if we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, there are going to be people that are lying about us. There are going to be people that are bad-mouthing us. There are going to be people that are harmful to you, that will ruin your reputation, that will cause you to lose position in your job, or whatever else. If you're facing persecution, you're on the right path. Even Paul said this about Jesus. I want to know him even in his suffering. So, if the enemy can't buy us off with worthless things, then maybe he can create enough fear in us to keep us sidelined. And let's look at Paul. Paul left his home, comfort, and power and position to preach to foreign communities, even when their reaction meant that there were mobs of people attacking him and trying to murder him. And the beautiful thing in this passage is, I think, you know, the miracle that started this off, this man who was lame for life is walking, that's an amazing miracle. But I think the end of this biblical account is just as amazing. Here's a guy that is stoned to death, and he gets up and he walks back into the city. What this tells me is, if the Holy Spirit is leading and guiding your life, no weapon that's formed against you shall prosper. Great miracle. And how... Did Paul walk back into that city? Now, it said he left the next day. But we know that when he comes back through on his missionary journey, he goes back to this place. People are going to be worth the rejection and persecution that you face. In this season, we need to proclaim Jesus all the more. People will always try to, to narrate the life of Jesus and, and the gospel to their own comfort level. But we can't play politics because Jesus doesn't play politics. You want to you see, you want to know how inclusive Jesus is? For God so loved the whole world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him might not perish, but have eternal life. Whoever. So let's stop avoiding rejection and persecution. Next week, we're going to look uh, possibly at, at their reporting after their first missionary journey. And they're so excited. How could they be excited? Mobs ran them out of every city. That doesn't seem to make sense. That doesn't seem like a successful mission, does it? 
Yes, but people were saved. Yes, lives were changed. We have brothers and sisters. I am an adoptive parent. Three of my kids are adopted. Was that easy? Oh, you better believe it wasn't easy. It was a battle. It was a battle at home at times. It was a battle in the court system. It, there are battles that still remain. But was it worth it to me have, for me to have sons and daughters? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'll bear those scars any day of the week. Do what God calls you to do, and He'll empower you to do it. Lord Jesus, I pray that as we allow you to speak at our hearts at this time and, and respond to your call, that you would show us the worthless things that the enemy dangles in front of us and says, you deserve this, you need this. Help us to value you, to realize that all that we need in life is found in you, God. Help us to deliver that message of truth as we live it out in such a way, God, that there is just grace and love flowing from us. Help us to no longer be trapped by fear of how we'll be received, because as this passage shows, these people that proclaimed Paul and Barnabas as gods in one instant tried to murder them in the next. People are fickle. Even your word says, Jesus, that you did not entrust your heart to men. So God, we entrust our hearts to you because our hearts are safe with you. And you tell us who we are. And we want to follow you wherever you'll lead us. So help us to do that today in your name. Amen.